Hi everybody and welcome. My name is Deanna O'Connor and I'm the founder of the Speak Up Club, which is a workshop series originally um, and has turned into a lot of webinars now during the pandemic, but originally aimed at supporting women in business essentially to improve their public speaking skills and their personal presence. So we've branched out into a lot of other things in the webinars. Um, my background is in magazines and media broadcasting and today we're going to talk about time management. So I suppose from my own personal point of view, I would have been an editor in magazines and that was a job I signed up for when it was just writing, printing and then social media and things like that came in. So it then became you're also the editor of a website and you're also in charge of all these social media accounts associated with your job. And certainly when your job becomes a lot of things you weren't expecting and more and more kind of elements come into it, you certainly have to find ways to manage your time a lot better. Since then, I've become a freelancer, so my time is really my own and very precious to me. And so when your time is money and you're clocking every hour that you're working to see is this job worth it or not, you really do start to think about how you're using your time. So for me, becoming a freelancer was all about work-life balance. And so with that as well, I'm thinking about how I'm managing my time so that I can enjoy my time, make the most of it and make the most of my leisure time or the daytime or when there's some sunshine that I want to get out in. So I want to talk to you today about that, about how you can work smarter, not harder, how you can use your time wisely and hopefully make it more productive for you. And for me as well, I think a huge part of this is really that balance that you're not just using your time to work, 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 that you're using it to create space in your day, space for yourself, space for your sleep, space for your leisure, space for your loved ones. All those important things that we can kind of forget when we're like, on that little hamster wheel and just running, 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 running. So it is really important to make your time spacious and kind of expand your day if you can. I know we can't really mess with the laws of physics, but we can do our best. So let's get into it. So in terms of work, let's, let's dive in at the kind of work angle on this. When you're working, especially with the team, if you're a manager of a team, if you're a team lead, good time management makes all of your team happier. And even if your team is just you, think about it, how it'll maximize your productivity, your efficiency, but it also, if you kind of manage your time so that you're not just that hamster wheel trying to get like tasks and admin done, you also make that space for creative thinking. Because without that, without those breaks in your day, without having free time to let your mind wander, you can't really come up with creative solutions for things. And I think that's why often when people travel, they you know have new experiences, expand their thinking, they come up with innovative ideas or solutions. So sometimes we need to create that little space in our day in the workplace as well to make that time too, rather than just frantically trying to get through tasks. But also what really makes your team happy <laughs> is getting home early, which hasn't been an issue while we've all been working from home. But certainly as people start to go back to the office and have those, you know, two hours in the commute maybe every day, that's going to be something that is a lot more precious because we're having less time in our day once we start commuting again. So poor time management, in case we need to <laughs> drill down why we want to be good at managing our time, it creates stress, it creates headaches, you're disorganized, nothing gets done, you're working in the office late, you're taking your work home, you're missing your deadlines. You're delivering projects late, maybe, and that leads to disappointed customers. So everything is chaotic. <clears throat> and then sometimes you're super busy, but then you have doldrums and downtime. And are you using that time productively? Because sometimes after the big rush to get a deadline in, the downtime is very tempting to not use it, to just relax, to kick back. So it's important to find that balance so that you know, those peaks of absolute chaos are less, and then those absolute doldrums where you're doing nothing are actually used a little bit more productively to get things kind of moving so that the chaos doesn't start again if something else kind of comes on, that you have that kind of groundwork done. So I think it's really important to be really pragmatic about your time, and that's one piece of advice I would give you, that, you know, if you feel like you're not the most organized person or you kind of dread getting into that piece of work, just being very tick things off the list, get stuff done, just, you know, plow through those little tasks when you have that time can really set you up for those busier periods. And even though they're boring and you don't want to do them, I think sometimes just being like, right, let's write the list 
And let's just take these things off can be really, really helpful when you have that time to kind of create that space for you to kind of store it and bank it for you. So let's talk a little bit more about how we can be more effective around managing that time. You've probably heard this one before, smart goals are so important. So when you're setting your goals, setting goals that are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-oriented is the advice from the ages. No one would deny that. And the time-oriented thing can be very helpful because especially if like me, you're a freelancer, some things have deadlines, but other things like doing my taxes <laughs> have a deadline that's kind of far in the future. But if I say, right, I'm going to get them done by May, my accountants will love me. And that will give me that little boost to kind of go and do that sooner. So setting your SMART goals is really important, but also then kind of working backwards from that. You know, if you have a deadline for things that, you know, don't necessarily have a deadline, then you can work backwards and kind of allocate little bits of time to them. And I think with the bigger kind of things like doing your taxes, maybe saying, right, I'm going to do 20 minutes of this a week. And then all of a sudden, over the course of a few weeks, you'll find it is done. So rather than kind of going, right, I'm going to just like, oh, when I have to do that, I'll just give a day to it and I'll play through it that day. You know, things happen in life sometimes and that time never happens. So those kind of bigger tasks that are far in the future, starting with 10 minutes a day or 20 minutes a week and just tipping away at those things can kind of get them done in a very under the radar way, which can be really helpful. Now, the other thing I would say is that <clears throat> allocating your time to things, I've started using an app called Clockify and there are various other time management apps available. But what I do is I clock the time I spend on projects. And the reason I do it is more to see if the rate I'm charging really kind of um, is the right rate for the amount of time the job would take me. Because sometimes when you're pitching or giving a, a quote for something, it can be quite hard to tell if it's how long it's going to take you. So sometimes if it's a new client, clock the hours, see if it's been, you know, allocated right. But <clears throat> thinking about that, it's like thinking, well, how much time does this task deserve? So let's kind of reverse engineer that. If you're thinking about little admin tasks that are taking up a lot of your time, maybe you need to allocate them a certain amount of time. How valuable is this work? How much of my time does it deserve? Can I delegate it to someone else? And this is where we talk about prioritizing wisely. So thinking about if there's a deadline, if you have a team, who do you have to work on the task? And what kind of impact will this task have? Because sometimes we can go down absolute rabbit holes of spending a lot of time on something that really doesn't give us the return on investment. So I know for me, I spent a lot of time, say, on, or if I spent a lot of time, for instance, on a Facebook advertising campaign, but my people who are my audience aren't on Facebook, they're on Twitter or Instagram, well, I know Facebook and Instagram are linked now, but just say, for instance, if you're spending time on something that isn't getting you the value back, so maybe you're spending a lot of time on Twitter, but your audience aren't on Twitter, well, why spend that time? So just nix it, just spend less time there. Think about what you're getting out of where you're spending your time. And sometimes you need to really look at everything you're doing, clock your hours in the day, see where that time has gone, and actually, you know, do your little pie chart and go, right, well, most of my time is spent on this thing, but most of my money isn't coming from that thing. So you need to sort of making that like slice of pie for that thing smaller and trying to delegate. But also <clears throat> I would say a lot of us, and me certainly as a, as a former editor and someone who had to proofread a lot, I would get very bogged down in the dotting the I's, crossing the T's, little details. I mean, I'd hold up sending a magazine to print because there's an extra space after a full stop. So, you know, those little details, you can get bogged down in those and then fail to see the sort of bigger strategic picture and where your time might be better spent. So, you know, would your time be better spent making sure there's not an extra space or an extra word somewhere or would it be better spent out schmoozing advertisers to give you lots of money? So think about where you want your business to go and where your time is actually going to be most valuably spent. Then I think creating a timeline for tasks can be very valuable. It just sets those goals up in your head. So for instance, if you kind of have a project and give yourself a deadline or maybe have a deadline, 
then working back and creating that sort of critical time path can be very helpful. Um, for instance, when I was running events, and I'm sure maybe the, the ladies in Iconic might agree with this point that we would always create a critical time path for the day. So, you know, we're running an award ceremony. Um, someone is coming on stage to accept their award at half past 10 at night. We literally have an Excel spreadsheet from half past seven that morning detailing every single thing that is happening that day up until that point. Now, you might not need to go into that level of granular detail for every project you're doing, but you know, if everything is going to happen and happen smoothly, then trying to stick to those times when things should happen will make it happen much more smoothly. And then you can see very clearly if you've gone off course and when you need to correct, because sometimes you can go down those rabbit holes and not see that you've gone off course until it's too late. So timeline can be really valuable in that way. And this does take a little bit of pre-organization, I will say. And there's a, there's a little bit of a, you know, when you're doing your leaving search and you're calling, color coding your, um, your notes and things and all those little kind of time wasty things before you get into the actual study. So try not, try not to do too much pre-organization as a way to avoid doing the work, <laughs> but certainly a little bit of clarity and pre-planning around how you're gonna do the work can help you just keep yourself on track and check yourself. So I would say, <clears throat> again, with prioritizing work, I would always think about, what things are most important to work on first. So I would juggle a lot of different projects. I'm you know, still editing publications, I'm writing, I'm doing webinars. I hopefully will be doing real life workshops again soon. So there's a lot of balls in the air. And again, I'm like thinking, right, what is the most valuable client? Maybe a, a client who doesn't pay so well, when I have a bigger project on, I might say I can't do so much for them this month or that I can do it on a longer deadline if they want me to do some work for them. If I have a short deadline and a quick turnaround, obviously that has to happen first. So you have to shelve everything else that's a longer deadline before you do that. And then also um, foundational planning, I've just spotted a typo in my slide, how embarrassing. <laughs> um, foundational planning, that last line um, of the first group should read for long-term projects. So even though you might be kind of rushing through things that have a deadline, it's always important to take that thinking space and do a little bit of pre-planning on something that's maybe a longer term project, but has, you know, is going to take a lot of work. So for instance, I have something coming out and it's a supplement and I know I don't have to have it in for maybe six or eight weeks, but I also will have to contact maybe 150 people to do it this. So I don't want to leave sending those 150 emails until the week before it's due. I want to get them out eight weeks before it's due. So I have time to go through and get in touch with all of those people. So that kind of thing, even though I'm super busy with another project right now, it's worth my while doing that planning and just taking that hour or two to get those emails sent, get that contact list built up. So thinking about what you have long term that really needs a bit of attention now that can make things much easier in a couple of weeks or a couple of months is worth taking that time out for. But also, and I would say that a lot of us can you know, forget this, that important things really are sleeping well, exercising, eating your breakfast, unless you're an intermittent faster, and your loved ones. Because one of my favorite phrases that I ever heard when I was very wrapped up in my work was, the company doesn't love you, the, your family do. So never put, you know, spending time at work ahead of spending time with the people who matter in your life, because ultimately, what you should be doing is, you know, doing your job to the best of your ability, but also creating space in your life to enjoy your life outside of work. So you don't want to be taking your work home. You don't want to be spending till 11 o'clock at night in the office. You want to maximize your efficiency while you're there and get the hell out of there and get home and live your life as well. So I would say that if those second list of things aren't happening and aren't you know, right for you, then you really need to look at the time management in the, the daytime at work, because making the time for life, I think, is really the most important bit. So back to work anyway, for the moment. One of the things I think is really important that if you are in a position to hire people is, or, or a team leader, is getting the right people doing the right things. So if you're, if you're hiring, hire for your weaknesses. Don't hire someone who is the same as you with the same skills as you. 
hire the person who has things that are complementary to you that will bring an extra thing to the team that have the skills that aren't already there. Um, and then if you have people already working for you, allow people, if you can, as much as possible, the ability to job craft. So job craft is when people can kind of have a little bit, bit of control over their day, have, you know, take on tasks or projects that are, that are really kind of speaking to their skills and that they can kind of push themselves in the direction that they will flourish in. So if you can allow yourself to job craft first, definitely do. Um, and if you have a team, then allow them to shine at what they're good at because, you know, there's no point having someone working for you who is amazing at something and then just getting them to do something that they're rubbish at. So as much as you can, hire people who are great at things you're not good at and let people do things that they're good at because they will bring more to the team by, you know, doing their main thing that they're good at. So also delegating is super important. And sometimes I think it can be very hard for some of us who can be micromanagers. Um, but I found that definitely micromanaging seemed to be quite a big thing during the pandemic that a lot of micromanagers had to deal with <laughs> because for the first time people weren't under their nose they couldn't check on them I heard stories of people having to do their calls over you know um Webex or Teams and things like that so that it could be logged what they're doing when they're doing it because they weren't trusted to be on a work call versus a personal call so I think these things are really important and they're very interlinked. So delegating really needs trust. You have to trust that the person you're delegating to will do the job. And the main way to do that is to give them deliverables. You know, they have to reach those KPIs. They have to produce if they're being delegated to. So I think that you need to be in a position to just let them go and do the job and not check up on them all the time, but have that weekly or monthly meeting where you're like, right, this is the check-in. What have you done? Are you actually producing what I've let you go away and produce in the way you want to produce it? So <clears throat> trust versus micromanaging is really important for getting people to do their best work. And if they feel trusted, I think that allows them to shine more as opposed to feeling kind of put upon and stressed out because it's giving them that little burst of anxiety every time they see an email from you or see your name on the phone if they're not trusted. So really to make more time for yourself if you are in a position where you have a team or people to delegate to that you're giving them the work and you're trusting them to go away with it and not letting it in on your own head either that you're constantly worrying about it because that's not giving you free time that's just giving you anxiety so you want to create this space for yourself where you can so when you are doing something, regardless of whether you're a team leader or part of the team or a freelancer on your own, be fully engaged with the task in front of you. <clears throat> this is something I think that in today's world where we have so many different things coming at us from so many different directions can be very difficult. You know, we're so used to sitting in front of the TV, maybe with the phone or the iPad, maybe on Twitter, checking out the Love Island hashtag, whatever it is, and we're not fully watching TV because we've one eye on the phone, maybe one eye on WhatsApp, maybe one eye on Twitter. We're in work, we have, might have a couple of screens, we might have a couple of tabs open. And so we're kind of switching between our emails and maybe a document we're working on and flicking back and forth. And then we go to look up something, but we see another email from someone else. And all of a sudden it's like, what was I even doing? So close your tabs, have one or two tabs open that you really need to do the task. If you can turn off the notifications on your computer. So, you know, turn off that little notification that pops up on the screen every time you get an email. Try not to switch tasks. Switch task has been proven in studies to just waste your time fully. It's really hard to concentrate. It's really hard to get back into the first task you were doing if you kind of keep hopping between two tasks. So the best advice would be to set dedicated email checking times. Don't have notifications. Decide for yourself, I'm going to spend nine to 9.30 checking my emails. I'm gonna look them at them again at half 11 or 12 or just before lunch, depending on your work day and how much you need to be on top of those emails. Maybe it's on the hour every hour, but looking at them just constantly interrupting what you're doing is really, really disruptive to your focus. So 
I would say definitely what is really useful for this is a Pomodoro timer, which you can look up Pomodoro. It's Italian for tomato. Um, I don't know the significance of that, but the Pomodoro method basically involves doing 25 minutes focused work on a task. Then you get up for five minutes, walk around, get a cup of tea, go to the loo, do a stretch, whatever it is, sit back down 25 minutes on the next task or go back to that task if it still needs doing. But rather than switch tasking here and there, if you have a few things you're juggling, you do your 25 minutes, you take your five minute break, you do your 25 minutes, you take your five minute break. And then after the third round, I think it is, you take a 15 minute break or maybe it's lunchtime by then. So you're taking a little break every so often. And I think that is really important as well, just in terms of well-being, because you need to stand up, you need to move around, you need to not be hunched over your desk, you need to move your body. Um, and the first break you take, you won't think you need it. You're like, I've only done 25 minutes. I can just work through this one. Don't do that. Do the break, stand up, do a little stretch, get a cup of tea, whatever it is. But definitely get up and move if you can. Even go to the water cooler if you're in the office, because by the time the third round comes around and you've taken those five minute breaks, you'll start to see how much more energized you are and how much more focused you are. And then it clicks in that you need to take that five minute break. You understand that it works and why it's working. So highly recommend doing that. I know there's some days when it's tempting to be like, no, I'm too busy, I can't, but it really is effective. And once you start doing it, you know, you, you'll just notice the difference of that constant focus, break, focus, break. It's, I find it really powerful. So another thing that's a bugbear of mine in time wasting is starting your meetings on time. Um, and someone was just telling me the other day they were doing a master's recently. Um, and when it was in real life, you know, sometimes the lecturers might turn up half an hour later or something. And they were like, I've taken a day off work for this. Not, not acceptable. So I think that, you know, meetings are eating into everyone's time. And certainly over the past year and a half or so, we've all think, that kind of phrase, oh, that meeting could have been an email, never was it more true. So a meeting really needs to, you know, make itself pay for itself. These days, we have very much lowered our tolerance for them. So set an agenda is like absolutely essential and no meeting should not have one. Um, the next thing is if that, you know, the meetings really are dragging and everyone's using it as an excuse to waffle and chat and have coffees, do a stand up meeting. People are more energized, more focused, and nobody likes standing up for too long. So <laughs> they tend to go a lot faster and you can sell it to your team as a we'll be more energized, more lively. It brings a more vibrancy to the meeting, but also it does make them go faster. And then if you can gently suggest using a timer for people. So, you know, you could bring in something like, so we're going to give everyone two minutes or three minutes to talk. For some people, and I know this from my work with the Speak Up Club, speaking for two minutes is their idea of hell. It strikes fear into their hearts. But for wafflers who love to come into a meeting and just use it as a stage for themselves to expand on their thoughts on life, it will at least, you know, shut that down. So it's very fair to give everyone their time to say their piece and have someone chairing a meeting, maybe someone who really has no skin in the game, that's just sort of a neutral kind of note taker or secretary to the meeting, if possible, that is, you know, just cuts people off and isn't, is quite neutral to what is being discussed or negotiated in the meeting. Then finally, I would say in terms of making the best use of your time, and I'm gonna wrap up on this, I think it's my last slide, is don't sweat the small stuff. One of the biggest wastes of time in your life is worrying. And there's a couple of different variations on this saying, but like worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. And that means, you know, you can worry all you want about things, but you're not going to fix them. It's not going to change them. All it does is ruin today and waste your time today that you could have spent more productively. So with that, oh, one more, last, one more last thing, actually. <laughs> I knew there was another one. I couldn't remember what it was. The other main thing I would say to you, if you, I mean, as a freelancer, this is certainly relevant to me, but, you know, you may not have such an option in your working life. It depends. But learning to say no to people and projects that do not align with your goals is also 
a very good way to create or save your time. Um, and that can be very difficult. And learning to say no is actually, I think, something we've previously done a webinar on here. I know I certainly do focus on it in my Speak Up Club workshops. And there are different ways to go about saying no, which I probably don't have time to get into here today. But it's very hard to say no in a work situation sometimes. And actually learning to say no or to kind of rebuff something gently without being heard to say the N-O word, which might be a dirty word in some offices, that you can push things off that really aren't relevant to you rather than just saying yes, because you feel you have to. Um, and that is also very important. But I think you can probably find that webinar up on the iconic YouTube channel um, because most of our previous stuff is up there as will this be and we'll also be sharing the slides with you but if you have anything you'd like to get in touch about you can catch me on speakupclub.ie and I will send out the contact details uh, with these slides afterwards.